hey, I think that noise tells me it's noon. And I know we still have some people logging on, but in an effort to be, uh, be timely with everybody's um, lunch hour, I want to go ahead and get started. I'm Mary Margaret Lemon. I am the president of Fort Worth Housing Solutions. And it's my um, honor, really, to share some information and history with you all today in celebration of Black History Month. Um, this is a video that we produced in partnership with the city of Fort Worth. And it was shot and edited by the um, city's communication and public engagement department. And we were very lucky that Scott Kent and our former um, um, director of public affairs, Margaret Rich, worked on this for, gosh, it felt like the better part of a year um, to record the history of Butler Place, one of the last traditional public housing um, developments in Fort Worth. And so this documentary features um, interviews with former Butler Place residents, as well as historic photos and um, some artwork that was done based on interviews with some of our residents. And so we premiered this video um, through COVID during the virtual um, Denton Black Film Festival, but we wanted to share it with other people. And so just to kind of give you guys some background, Fort Worth Housing Solution annually has a big um, Black History Month celebration where we educate staff and, and share in fellowship and food. But due to COVID, we had to rethink that. And so we thought sharing the video and a discussion um, about Butler Place and kind of the history and the future would be a great way to celebrate Black History Month this year. And then we took that and decided to open it up to the entire community because this is really a story that we want everybody to be involved in and know about and be a part of its future. So that's kind of how we got here. And when um, we were coming up with this idea, there was a night, the, the next night I couldn't sleep. I just had all these thoughts running through my head and I had to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and go just take two pages of handwritten notes. And so I'm gonna share them with you. So if you'll indulge me just a few minutes, I kind of wanna share my thoughts about how we, we are where we are today. Um, and it really started with me thinking about last summer when the nation had no choice but to face the horrible realities that exist for communities of color. And I was truly at a loss as a leader, um, not because I didn't understand or I wasn't outraged, but really because I was white. And I'm a white girl who leads an agency that serves a majority of African-American people. Um, and I employ a majority of African-American people. And so I was really questioning, did they wanna hear from me? What can I say that's gonna make this better? And I was raised in a generation that we were taught not to see color. And if you saw it, you definitely didn't talk about it. So it was pretty uncomfortable for me to know how to address these horrible tragedies that were facing the nation. And so I did what I do when I have an issue. I called Sonia. So Sonia Barnett is my deputy director. Um, she has been with the agency for almost 30 years and she knows our people and cares very deeply about our people. And so she does what she, she always does with me. She gave it to me straight. And that's the reason we're such good friends. She told me, this is not about you winning. This is about doing the right thing. And if you're one of my employees on the line today, you know, that's what we say all the time. We just do the right thing. And um, she gave my words right back to me. And I realized the right thing right now is, is not about going about our job quietly, but to publicly talk about what we stand for and what we won't let happen in our community. And at Fort Worth Housing Solutions, that's any type of racism or discrimination. Fort Worth Housing Solutions, our employees, our staffs, our board, we all truly believe that everyone deserves a safe place to call home. And so that means that people have to see better to do better. And our board recognized that 20 years ago and started deconcentrating affordable housing, buying properties in all parts of the town and giving the opportunity to our residents to choose where they live. But we're working against a system that was created 80 years ago. And that's hard. That's a long history of horrible policies to undo. Um, I wanted to share with you the last in-person conference I got to go to was in Austin. And the keynote speaker was Richard Rothstein, who wrote the book, The Color of Law. And I bought the book last March. And I have to tell you, for somebody that's a voracious reader, it's a really hard book for me to get through. There's times I have to literally set it down and get to a better headspace because it physically makes me sick. You know, it discusses the history of public housing and how we got to where we are today. And it is, it's a history I'm not proud of. It's something that makes me feel guilty. It's a reality that the system was created to not just favor, but to ensure that one race came out better than the other. And so if it was so much harder for African-Americans to find a place to safely raise a family and sleep at night, 
it only makes sense that the generational impacts are still felt today. But in all that, there's a silver lining. I'm really glad that God put me where I am today so I can play a small part to change that history. And one of the ways that we are doing that is that we're honoring our past. Five years ago, Fort Worth Housing Solutions created a Butler Advisory Committee. We wanted community input and stakeholders to talk about what we needed to preserve from Butler Place and where the future should go. So I've had the privilege over the last five years to work with some local heroes like Sue Jennings and Brenda Sanders Wise and Sarah Walker and Opal Lee. Um, and we've together tried to do the right thing for the community. We knew that capturing the landscape of Butler was very important. So like I said, about a year ago, we worked with the city to create this video. And there's much smarter people to discuss it. And so we invited them all to be here with us today. And so I wanna introduce the panel. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Bob Ray Sanders will serve as our moderator and he is the director of communications for the Fort Worth Metropolitan Black Chamber. He's been a, if you've lived in Fort Worth for any number of years, you know he's been a well-known journalist, um, former Star-Telegram, associate editor and columnist, and he actually graduated from I.M. Terrell right here next door to Butler Place. Sonia Barnett, who I already mentioned, is my deputy director here at Fort Worth Housing Solutions. And um, she joined us in 1993 and knows all things uh, residence program, just top to bottom. She knows this agency inside and out. Um, and then Michael Morris is with us today. And Michael's been a dear friend of the Housing Authority. He's been one of our staunchest supporters. Um, he's the director of transportation at North Central Texas Council of Government. And he's been working with us to um, create opportunities to not isolate Butler Place and Cavill Place and um, really take advantage of transportation, housing, working together as infrastructure. And our last but not least panelist is my friend Dee Jennings. Um, he's the president and CEO over at the Metropolitan Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, and he's been there for over 20 years. And um, he's also a former resident of Butler Place and can speak directly to its history and the time he spent growing up here. So I'd like for you all to um, watch the video with me with an open mind and an open heart. And if you have ideas about how Fort Worth Housing Solutions can bring about change in our community, please don't hesitate to reach out um, and we look forward to working with you. So Kristen, let's watch the video. How I feel about moving, uh, this is amazing. <laughs> I feel as though that I, God been so good to me and my family. I just seem as though I shouldn't move. <laughs> For Margaret Jennings, Butler Place was home for 65 years. One of Fort Worth's oldest public housing projects, it opened in the 1940s for low-income residents of color. They used, used to call it the project. And I noticed uh, one of the managers, her name is Miss Holston, she used to tell me, don't say project, say public house. <laughs> Sometimes I still say the project. After more than 80 years, the red brick buildings are showing their age. Butler Place is closing, and housing officials are helping residents relocate to new homes throughout the city. Moving out means closing the door on a piece of Fort Worth history. In fact, the history of public housing in America. Many are thrilled to get a fresh start in new modern apartments. Oh my God. It is beautiful. Oh my God, look at this bathroom. Soak a tub. Oh, this is nice. Others, like Margaret Jennings, are more nostalgic. She raised three sons at Butler Place and remembers a strong sense of community there. We had a club, a neighborhood club, and uh, I was the vice president. And uh, a friend of mine, her name was Gladys Amerson. She was the president. And we was always trying to get things done for the neighbors. The club was trying to get things in here mm -hmm. for the kids. We need a washer We got a washer too. And uh, we got a lot of things done here in Butler. Like their mother, the Jennings brothers have fond memories of growing up in Butler Place. The memories that I have are mostly like the people, you know, 
I had a lot of friends. As far as activities, we had Port Chop Hill. We run up and down. We had the grassy hills. We did slides on. And then we had basketball go down the street. And it's an area that we probably visit called the Free Show Hill. Free Show Hill. About where those trees are down there was where they erected this large screen, like a movie screen. And what you could do is take what we call a pallet. And you take the pallet out, that means you get your popcorn and your hot dogs and your food, and you take it to the Free Show Hill, and you lay on the pallet, and they will show you movies till one o'clock in the morning. The atmosphere at that time here in Butler when I grew up is that, yes, you were poor, but you might not have known you per se were poor. The boys credit life at Butler Place and their mother for instilling strength of character despite their modest upbringing. I used to sit at a table uh, when we got ready to eat, and uh, I didn't only feed them food. I would uh, uh, give them, uh, I would lecture them and, ad and advise, give them a lot of advice mm -hmm. and while they was chewing. <laughs> 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 they had something to chew on. A lot of times, mom would have me, I guess, busy, you know, like she made me join the uh, YMCA and so that kept me busy. So during our time, we had a whole lot of community involvement with each other. And, and, and that kept us going and it, and it created opportunities for us to work. I even had a little detail during the summer months of cutting grass and painting uh, the old folks uh, structures on the inside. We had to paint every two years. So I had a ground crew and I had a paint crew. And so we worked. And it made a difference because we were always busy working, doing something for Miss Rosie or Miss Jones and that sort of thing. I was able to have uh, a nice little wardrobe because I had saved up all the money, you know, during the summer months. We were chumps with changes, they say, and it helped us when we were able to go back to school. Yeah, you had people on welfare, but we fared well because we worked. And it created a work ethics for us. And. Uh, some of us still working like myself, but it, it, if you were here, that's what you did. You worked, and nothing per se was given to you. You had to earn it. During the Great Depression, thousands of Fort Worth families made less than $1,000 a year. They lived in substandard houses, shacks really, throughout the city. So when Butler Place opened in 1940, it was a godsend for many of the city's poorest residents. The Fort Worth Housing Authority, as it was known then, decided to build Butler Place on Chambers Hill, close to what was then called the Colored High School, just east of downtown. At the time, it was the city's only public high school for African American students. Butler Place was named for Henry H. Butler, a Civil War veteran and the first African American teacher in the Fort Worth school system. As the need for public housing grew, Butler Place expanded in the 1960s and upgraded the original units. Surrounded by three major highways, the complex was physically isolated from many basic social services and retail. So, with the help of community partners, the Housing Authority brought in a top-notch child care center, youth activities, and a library. Butler children attended segregated schools, what later became G.W. Carver Elementary and I.M. Terrell High School. But, D. Jennings says it was hardly a second-rate education. My teachers are here with great teachers. A lot of those teachers were graduates with a lot of various degrees, but at that time, because of segregation, they were not able to go to other places. So we had some of the best teachers here. When I was coming up, I didn't have to deal with a lot of drugs. I just didn't. The generations after me did have to deal with some of that, and it created more of a poverty trap over here. Also, over time, it became increasingly difficult to maintain the aging Butler property. To add central air conditioning, upgrade appliances, much less provide modern internet connections, would be difficult and costly. Butler Place needs to close because it's not up to modern day living standards. Concrete floors and walls aren't what we want for our families. 
Over the years, the way that we administer public housing has changed. We know that concentrating families in one area is not good for anyone. We really want them to have access to green space, grocery stores, parks, great schools, jobs, and transportation. I'm an advocate of decentralization of poverty. Here at Butler, you got 300 or 400 apartments, and I don't know how many people live here, but my point is that you got all poverty impacted people living together. When you spread them out and they see things differently, they will act differently, most of them will, and have better opportunities. Beginning in 2017, Fort Worth Housing Solutions began helping residents prepare to move out of Butler, giving them a choice of numerous new affordable apartments located throughout the city. HUD's Rental Assistance Demonstration Project, called RAD for short, made this possible. The Jennings brothers moved out of Butler long ago and tried for years to get their mother to move too. With news that Butler Place would be closing, she finally agreed and chose an affordable hillside apartment. She's gonna be in a comfortable property that's near town in an area that we grew up in before we moved actually to Butler. And so uh, she's from what we call the bottom area of Fort Worth. And she's a Fort Worth lady and she, I mean, she's been here all her life. And she's gonna be in an area that she's very familiar with. For mother, it's becoming a full circle, you know. She's going back to where it all started. Well, I like it's nice and, and the rooms are nice. And I think I'm closer to the grocery stores. You know, the next store, they are very, very nice. They don't dirty the bottom of your skillets when you cook, because I love to cook. Dee Jennings believes other Butler residents will be just as happy in their new homes. I think once they get acclimated to their new environments with the new housing that I've seen across this city that's been provided for them, they're going to say, ooh-wee, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> that's what they're going to say. And, and, and that new housing, we're going to bring them some new opportunities, get them a fresh start. Uh, it's, it's just going to be better. Fort Worth Housing Solutions has worked really hard for the last 20 years to deconcentrate public housing. We now have properties in every corner of the city. And we give our residents the power to choose where they want to live, where they can be successful. City leaders are talking with the community about future plans for the 42-acre Butler Place campus. The original Carver Elementary School building where housing authority offices are located will remain, and possibly others. But most everything else will come down. It's time, it's due, it, it served its purpose. Hello, I'm Bob Ray Sanders, and I'm glad all of you joined us here. Um, remembering our history, telling it, honoring our history. That's part of what we're here today for. And thanks to all of you who joined us. We've got a whole bunch of people uh, with us, and I want you to know that we're going to try to get to your questions, if you have them, or your comments. And we ask you to go to the chat section uh, and, and just type it in, and we will, we will take it and get to them as soon as possible. We know we can't get to all of them because... Everybody out there has a story to tell or some questions to ask, but I want to reintroduce our panel who's joining me today and we're going to further this discussion. Uh, you've already met Mary Margaret Lemons, President and CEO of Fort Worth Housing Solutions, Dee Jennings, who's the star of that video you just saw. Um, Dee, by the way, is a graduate of IM, Carol, as I am. I'm going to tell both of our ages, Dee, I mean, they know that you uh, are at the Black Chamber, but many of them may not know that before that, I mean, you were a star down at the uh, electric company, TXU and Encore, uh, a person who was uh, one of their specialists, community, uh, community specialists, as well as a lobbyist down at the state legislature. And they may not know, Dee, that uh, you were on the championship 1965 state basketball team uh, that brought back the trophy to I.M. Terrell. So I'm telling you it all. And I'm going to come back to you in just a minute to start with you. But also with us is Sonia Barnett, Barnett, Deputy Director and Senior VP for Public Housing 
Housing Operations and Client Services with Housing Solutions, and Michael Morris, Director of Transportation for North Central Texas Council of Governments. You said something in the video that 95% of us at IM Terrell could have said, no matter what community we came from, and we came from all over the county and even outside the county uh, to come to IM Terrell. You said, yeah, we were poor, but we didn't really know it, or we didn't consider ourselves in poverty. Well, why not? <laughs> I mean, how, how did we live in, in these communities and not realize what everybody else thought of us as just poor folk? Well, Bob Ray, one thing for sure, our parents didn't make us feel that way. And the community around us was more holistic. Uh, it, it was a village and a child uh, opportunity back then. And the village did raise the child, which expanded beyond the public housing units that we lived in. And our teachers, our teachers may, never gave us an opportunity to feel that uh, we were missing anything because they just thought we didn't. So we just had a different atmosphere. We had a community and we had a neighborhood. And I just think all those combination of things kept us busy. All our teachers kept us busy. Sports kept, kept us busy. So we didn't have time to reflect on being poor. We just had time to reflect on getting better. That's what I think happened to us. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, as I said, we all came from different parts of the city and the county. And we, and we were a community there around IM Carroll surrounded a great degree by Butler. Most certainly. And uh, Butler, um, I, let, I later found out, it was, it was a joke to me then, uh, Mayor Kay Granger had a meeting and she was asking about Butler housing and what was going on over there. But there were some people in the room that was really having a good time about the new housing at that time that was coming downtown, uh, the condos. And they were talking about the bricks and how nice they was. And I said, you know, I just didn't know how fortunate I was. And some of y'all will get that for us over there. <laughs> so that's what was happening at Butler. <laughs> you know, we just didn't know how fortunate, fortunate we were until later in life, probably. And uh, you know that Bob Ray coming from Moses Valley and Grapevine and even coming from Mansfield. So uh, I am terrible that the education and the atmosphere was different. Right. And Mary Margaret, it's, it's been uh, touched on, but let's just say it bluntly. Public housing was segregated, like public everything else. Public schools, public everything was segregated. Uh, and, and yeah, we worked on it. But wh why, why did it take so long, do you think, for us to integrate public housing? And even when we integrated it, it wasn't really integrated from my point of view. What took so long? I think it's very similar to regular housing. I mean, it's any type of housing. People are located in one place, they get comfortable there, they have a support system and a network. And so for them to pick up and move to an unknown neighborhood is sometimes really challenging. We, we you know, we've relocated residents through multiple transformations, whether it be Ripley or Butler, and we've learned every time how to ensure that people have a successful, um, a successful move, and we want them to have choice. And so I think it's, you know, policies and laws were put in place back in the 1930s and 40s that really prevented integrated housing. And some of them didn't come off the books at all. Some of them still are there. Um, they're just not being observed. And, you know, it's had long lasting effects for decades. Right. And, and Sonia, you've been with uh, Public Housing Solutions, I think, since 1993, which means you've seen a lot of change. You helped bring about some of that change. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the changes. I mean, uh, we've touched on it a bit. But was it difficult? Was there resistance to the change? And in my mind, I think there was, but I, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Absolutely. I, I don't think so much from the, the community itself um, with the residents that lived in the communities as much as it was from the greater community. I think that we had resistance from the greater community and that we didn't want housing transitioning into our neighborhood. And so we had some, we had some pushback uh, early on when we began the process of deconcentration of the Ripleyano public housing community. And we were met with a lot of resistance and not so much from the residents, the residents were ready for a change. And as we're talking about Butler, you saw in the video, it's surrounded by highways. And so residents were ready to make that move. They were ready for an opportunity to, 
to have access to the latest amenities, to have access to transportation in stores that they didn't have in the Butler community because they were so isolated. With the Butler transition and with, with us doing the relocation from the Butler housing community, we actually were, were very successful in the transition. The residents were very involved in the process. They participated in all the meetings. We invited the communities where our residents were relocating to, to participate. And I think that has to do with why we were so successful in, in the relocation of our Butler residents. And really, you know, you asked Mary Margaret the question why it took so long. In 1998, HUD actually passed uh, legislation that said, we are now requiring that all public housing authorities deconcentrate poverty. We are now requiring that all housing authorities start looking at, at developing mixed income, mixed use communities so that we can take this concentration of poverty and spread it throughout the city. For us, we did it in such a unique way that we took small increments so that we didn't cluster poverty again, so that we didn't have a concentration of poverty again. And we were really successful in doing that and we continue to be successful in doing that. I mean, I've been fortunate that in the last 30 years, I've been able to really truly say that I've been a part of changing the face of public housing. Fantastic. And I think Fort Worth apparently is one of the leaders in the country of being able to do that. But Michael, uh, she just mentioned, and, and it was mentioned in, in the video that the freeways was part of that isolation that helped make that. And of course, we all know that freeways, expressways have gone through poor communities, divided poor communities because uh, the land was cheaper there. And, and frankly, the political power was not there to fight it. Uh, where are we now in terms of how we do freeways and, and especially when it deals with poor communities, Black communities and, and Hispanic communities in particular, is that the reason that we're in the shape we're in? And then how do we change that once we go to another model when public housing is no longer there? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, very much, Bob Ray, you're correct in the criticism that freeways were built, sometimes elevated, uh, bifurcated communities uh, often were routed in, in uh, places of people least voice. And then in our region, we're obviously trying to correct that. That was done before our time. We are, you know, depressing the Southern Gateway. We're putting pedestrian caps over the roadways. We're re the thoroughfare streets. Um, you know, I think the key words you've heard so far is choice, access, and opportunity. Those are the same things that drive transportation, access, choice, and opportunity. So the first thing we're doing uh, is focused on where the decentralized housing is. We follow Mary Margaret around. Uh, we very much ap appreciate her vision. And then on the transportation side, we're, we're providing whatever we need to do. If it's part of a financial waterfall to make the project work, if it's transportation, if it's subsidizing, you know, transit passes. We're moving from what Mr. Jennings referred to as, you know, we felt this was quote our community, but I hear him use the word community in the singular. This was people of of like skin. What what you see Fort Worth Housing is doing is they're, they're creating communities, plural. They're creating families to be able to go to a decentralized structure and then do whatever they want with regard to their future, with regard to opportunities and choice. We are going back uh, to the Butler Place. We are uh, trying to create as much accessibility as we can to that historic location that by definition, I would argue is isolated that wasn't a coincidence uh, with regard to it, given Mary Margaret's introduction. We're trying to increase the value of the land that she holds at, at Fort Worth Housing to increase that value. So when that land goes on the market, 100% of that gain in value will go to housing. And that will be a revenue source that she can use in the rest of the community. So we're bringing these accessibility items in her decentralized housing structures, and we're going back to her mothership and changing the transportation access to increase her value so she can deliver a whole bunch more housing solutions 
to the community. Okay, and let's talk about the change that is coming. The change has already occurred to a degree, but uh, I do remember when they expanded Butler Housing. I had just gotten to the seventh grade, I think, uh, at uh, I.M. Terrell Junior High. Uh, and looking north, I saw those houses that were in the path of this expansion of Butler. And we saw the bulldozers come in after they had moved the people out and bulldoze those houses into piles and then one by one set those piles on fire. And, and that happened for weeks. And, and I thought about the people who were displaced then. Uh, the same thing with Ripley Arnold, as, as Sonia just mentioned that when Ripley Arnold was, was sold uh, to Tandy, I think it was, and, mm -hmm. and the people were moved, you had resistance from the places where they were going. And now we have a situation that looks like, and based on what Sonia and Mary Margaret said, the residents, I mean, displacement is displacement period, but it seems they are more accepting of the displacement. And all of you can speak to that. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Mary Margaret. Y'all convinced these people who were living there that it was time and not just time, but okay to leave. Did I get that right? No, we, we did. And we they, the residents were involved from the very beginning of us applying for this new demonstration project that HUD offered us as a tool. We had multiple meetings before we even applied. And then after that, we had just a variety of meetings. We, we knew that we were going to do a transfer of assistance to multiple properties. So the 412 units at Butler were um, set to go to 13 different properties across the city. And Sonia and her team put together um, basically a relocation package, a book for every location that said, what's around it? What schools are there? What churches are there? Where's the closest grocery store? What's the bus route? And really basically act as realtors for our residents to say, would you be interested in this property? And then we offered everybody a lottery for each property as those units became available because a lot of them were brand new construction. And so we would then send out a notice and said, you know, we have this many one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and so on. And if you're interested, let us know. And we're putting you in a lottery. So it was a fair way. We didn't let anybody jump in line or jump the system. And then we had people like Dee's mom. I mean, sweet Miss Jennings that said she wasn't moving for years and years and years. And then, you know, she finally saw what a different place could, how it could impact her life. And I think she's been very happy since she's been relocated. But our staff, uh, I, we had a question on the chat asking what support services I can tell you our support services are our resident services department. You know, they checked in with Ms. Jennings, continue to check in on Ms. Jennings to make sure that she's doing well and has what she needs. And so our housing authority, yes, we build bricks and sticks, we build housing, but we also have programs like our family self-sufficiency program. We have partnerships with um, TCC and we had like tomorrow we're having a job fair. So we do everything we can to not have people become dependent on assistance but rather um, gain the tools while they're on assistance to become self-sufficient. And so we have programs where you can, um, you know, join the family self-sufficiency program, meet your goals and be able to get a check at the end um, that I get to write to you. And so that can go to buy a house or, um, you know, buy a car or pay for college. So we're not just about housing people. We're really about lifting them up and getting them out of the cycle of, of poverty. And, and, and Dee, what, what is going to happen to the land. I know you've been on this committee. Uh, I mean, it's over 40 acres that we're talking about, very close to downtown, will soon be accessible according to what uh, Michael is saying. Maybe it's not decided what will happen there yet, but what should happen there in, in your opinion? Well, basically, I think you're going to have one of the hottest properties uh, in, in Texas because of the freeways and the access that uh, Michael Morris talk about, talked about that's gonna happen on that property. The value of it is going to uh, accelerate quite a bit. And I think you have a different type of product that uh, that project, uh, project itself at 42 acres will attract. And I think that attraction can come not only from locally, but from across this country. So I think it's gonna be a hot piece of property. I think the value of it is gonna go up. I think you have a different product, you know, you can dream, you could have a product such as a uh, new housing community, but that may not be just as a housing unit, the best use of that property. From an economic development perspective and here at the chamber, we probably don't think that, I know we don't think that's, that's, that's the, uh, 
security vest. It may be a combination of a campus uh, for a, a company, you know, uh, companies to move in with some housing. I think it's just going to be a different uh, economic mix. Uh, several months ago, we uh, at Butler and, uh, actually had meetings and had that discussion with developers and uh, stakeholders from all across Fort Worth. And it was a combination of what I've just said and some ideas as to what else could be there besides just housing as it had been uh, all along. You have to admit, uh, I mean, it's next to the freeway, it's near downtown, town is moving east, and you got the Trinity River that's there on the east end of that. And it just makes it, it just makes it a hot property and a good opportunity. Uh, I would also just say, um, because of that uh, uh, law that uh, Sonia talked about, uh, it changed how some of the opportunities for the public housing units to have people to go to some product that probably wasn't as plentiful years prior to that. So people, uh, you know, you really, when you looked at that film, you, you really had some, you didn't have to move from one project to another. You really had something to look forward to. I just wanted to have a little comment on that. But I just think it's a different, I think it's a different opportunity there. And, and I guess, Michael, in, in terms of planning, and I guess whether it's mixed use housing or resident, uh, nuisances or whatever, I just wonder, every time we have a major redevelopment of property, sometimes the people who were in the property before won't ever get a chance to be a part of the property in the future. And I'm wondering, is that being discussed at all? I mean, what, what, will the people who left Butler have a reason to come back to that property, regardless of what it is in the future? So, yeah, so let me take a stab at it. And then I think uh, Mary Margaret needs to add uh, to that conversation. Um, clearly, you know, some of the, you know, the historic school and the historic building or two are going to be used. There's a group to decide how much this history is going to be saved in its current format. You have to think of the historic uh, high school and you have the new uh, Fort Worth Independent School group there. So there's a whole legacy with regard to it. There's a commitment of a African-American museum. Should it be on that site or somewhere else? We wish to have a hand in, in being a, a, a participant in that. And Mr. Jennings right in that the future of this particular land, wouldn't it be really cool if it could be marketed for some future cultural elements with regard to African-American history? Wouldn't it be nice to, uh, in theory, uh, redevelop a, you know, a, a movie studio or a black artist or whatever that may be? But my interest is to be able to respond to whatever the social objectives are to maintain the history and what role we can play to do that and then maximize the accessibility. Our staff went out for maximizing bicycle pedestrian connections to the to the Trinity River. We're maximizing transit, next generation, battery powered vehicles into downtown. We're maximizing roadway access. We're gonna have a multimodal uh, improvement. We're land banking additional land to, to add to the sale of the land between uh, the area you know is Butler Place towards downtown. There's other land that's trapped in that maze of infrastructure of the railroad and the interstate highway. Um, as we bring transportation towards downtown, there's no reason why we can't gain value out of that property and turn it over to the, to the uh, housing authority. So you have really two objectives. You, you have to maintain some commitment to the historic neighborhoods, including the neighborhood that uh, Mr. Jennings' mom moved into. That, that has historic underpinnings. And then whatever the city decides is that historic foundation and the respect for that historic foundation, maximize the rest of that revenue, probably in you know a mixed use campus office. It is a lot of land in close proximity to downtown. Wouldn't it be nice to land a major employer or something somewhere in the United States to relocate there? And then, what the Black Chamber needs to establish is what are then the provisions 
necessary to have the appropriate mix of workers uh, on, on um, you know, doing the particular work. But let's, let's, let's take the modern initiative that Mary Margaret is laying out and let's totally integrate it horizontally in everything we do. So everyone knows the respect and pride that we're giving uh, to the history known as, as Butler Place. All right, um, I wanna remind people that uh, we're gonna have a film available, we'll post uh, online uh, to all the people who registered. Uh, how you can access that video. If you have questions, uh, write them in on chat. I think we've probably got a lot already coming in. Um, Mary Margaret, did you want to add anything to what uh, Michael just said? Sure. No, I appreciate everything Michael said. And and one of the ways I think that people will have an opportunity to come back here is, you know, Michael, you're looking at expanding the electric uh, bus system, you know, to come here eventually and things like that. So it's going to be part of a bigger system that, that impacts the whole community, hopefully. And so we've gotten some questions in chat and I wanna make sure that we address them. So they're asking whether former residents can be included in the conversation about the property. And the answer is absolutely. So we've had public um, meetings over the last couple of years and we always invite people to get involved. Please check our website, get on our mailing list um, so you can be aware of those opportunities and follow us on social media. Uh, because we do want to have everybody's um, thoughts and, and opinions taken into account as we make some of these major decisions. Um, there was a question about flooding and whether that was a concern with Panther Island, and we don't have that concern. We're not aware of any impact um, here to this property. And then there was a question about whether or not the area has been marked as historic. And so there are 17 acres of this property that were designated on the National Historic Register as a conciliation for the Ripley Arnold um, disposition. And so we are working with our Butler Advisory Committee on how to address that moving forward. And so like Michael talked about, the um, one thing that I have sworn that we're going to do, and we're in the process of, of nailing down right now, Dee's laughing, but he knows that Sarah Walker won't let me um, live until we um, make sure that the facade of our administration building here, which is the former elementary school, is preserved. And so we're working with um, a local architect who used to be head of the State Historic Preservation um, Office to, to decide what points are historic that need to be preserved and make sure we, we draft a deed appropriately. So that's in process. So the exterior of the admin is, is um, on our list. And then we're working with Dee and, and the Butler Advisory Committee to talk about how we can ask whoever ultimately owns this land in the future to rename streets to honor historic figures or to um, save some of the bricks to use for other projects down the way. So we're thinking of other ways that we can honor the history, but still bring the catalytic um, transformation to this property that the city um, really deserves. And so one thing to keep in mind, the housing authority has been busy. We have over 40 properties in our portfolio. And when we um, build or buy a property, it comes off the tax rolls. And so putting land back on the tax rolls is important to us to be a good steward of the community. Um, and, and you know, any proceeds that we get always go back into furthering affordable housing. So, you know, it's more more properties that we can build or properties that we can improve with the funds that, that we're able to receive. Okay, um, and, and Sonia, you uh, having worked more closely perhaps uh, than most other people with the residents directly, how do you personally feel uh, watching people leave Butler and go into places literally all over the city? You know, for, for me and, and my team and, and those that helped with relocation, Dana, Latoya, Lachelle, uh, Dina and her staff, Lanisha and her staff, I, I do want to give them credit because we had a full team that really worked to get our residents relocated. It's bittersweet. I mean, you know, being with the agency for as long as I have, you know, Dee can tell you it was a community. When I started in 1993, I remember walking the streets of, of Butler every day, you know, our, our, our Chamber Street. Um, so it was bittersweet, but I was excited and I was excited for the opportunity to be a part of it, but more importantly, I was excited for our residents because here they now have an opportunity to be in communities that, that gave them so much more access and opportunities. Um, you know, to be confined, you know, at a Butler, at a Cavill, at a Ripley Arnold and be extremely isolated in the way that they were. I mean, Dee talked about it earlier, it was a community. 
Well, they didn't have a choice but to be a community. They didn't know any other, um, uh, they didn't know anything else other than to rely on each other and, and count on each other and really be the neighborhood that Butler was back in the day when, when Dee lived there. So I was extremely excited for the opportunities. And, and I can tell you, Barbara, if you could just see the faces when people walked into their units, we got to be there. We got to be there when they signed their leases. You know, we, we helped them through that whole transition from, from the beginning to the end and still are working with, with the residents that have been relocated. And to know that, you know, a lot of them have elevated their lifestyle. Some of them got jobs in the neighborhoods in which they relocated to. Um, it was exciting and it was a very exciting time for us. All right. Well, thank. Uh, uh, I want. I need to correct. I said uh, go to the chat. And it's the Q and A section that you post your questions. And uh, Christian Sullivan has been monitoring that for us. I know Mary Margaret has already answered some questions that have popped up. Uh, Christian, do we have uh, more specific questions for our panelists? I don't see a whole lot of other questions. The the toughest question we had was from Dr. Edward Flournoy. And he wanted to um, hear what kinds of things Fort Worth Housing Solutions and other governmental agencies can do to contribute to more affordable housing in our community um, as an economic stabilizer. An easy thing for everybody to do is to say yes to affordable housing. We have a lot of neighborhood associations, associations or HOAs that oppose multifamily development, and they specifically oppose affordable multifamily development. And we spend a lot of time just educating those groups of people to, to make sure that they know who we serve. About almost half of our population are either elderly or disabled. And we know that those households are always gonna need assistance. They're not in a position to ever be completely self-sufficient. And so I want you to compare that to maybe your um, parents on a fixed income or a grandmother. Um, and so we, we know that saying yes to affordable housing is is one thing that anybody can do. But um, we would, we love to partner with people. If you're aware of any developer that's interested in affordable housing, we partner with public and nonprofit developers across the city to bring more resources to um, the Fort Worth community because we can't do it alone. Everything we do is in partnership. All of these spaces on the screen are our partners and we have probably a hundred more behind them. Um, there's just not enough resources from the federal government to serve everybody that qualifies. About a third of Fort Worth qualifies for some type of program that we operate, but we only have, I want everybody to hear this, we have five, about 5,000 vouchers. We have a few more for special programs, which are usually our homeless programs. So that's about 1,500 for special programs, but our housing choice voucher program, which everybody affectionately calls section eight, has about 5,000 spots. And so for a city of a million, that's a really tall order for us to help everybody that really needs help. So, um, so the federal program isn't going to get it. So we need local people to step up and, and partner with us to make more housing happen. And, and, and I don't want to get y'all into a political fight with anybody at the city or anywhere, but we always talk about affordable housing, even when we were building more units downtown and around downtown. And we, we don't seem to demand affordable housing. Uh, I mean, it seems to me developers get whatever they want. From our city. Now that's me. I, I'm, nobody else has to take responsibility for that statement. But I just wondered, should the city do more to demand from the developers coming in if they have a certain portion of their properties affordable, where, where we can include more people well, in some of these communities? Uh, yeah, well, Bray, this is this is Michael. Let me take a shot at that. So as we've expanded our role into in, from traditional transportation projects, Mr. Jennings and I were describing what we did 20, 25 years ago, starting out to redo Rosedale project, where we did Rosedale really as, a, as an impetus for land use change. It was the first transportation project built for land use change through the stop six neighborhood to create an opportunity. Same thing, choice, access, and opportunity. Um, if, if a mixed use developer or developer wishes to get transportation money, we don't, we don't flex that money to them without a discussion of housing. So um, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't sign up and say, gee, we'd like to build a nice mixed use development and we need some intersection money and some sidewalks and landscaping. You know, our staff says, yeah, I think those are really great, but 
I think the community really needs some portion of this housing uh, to be affordable. Um, and, and I think back to Mary Margaret's point, uh, during the social change notion that's so much impacted her in the int introduction, there's a lot of people in HOAs and a lot of people in the development community that, that haven't yet signed up for their social change ask. So there's nothing stopping you in your neighborhood to be either working with Fort Worth Housing Solutions and sign up for opportunities in, in that part of the region and or development developers that say, gee, we, we would love to partner with transportation interest and housing interest and do something really cool. Uh, you don't have to do everything through the formal federal housing assistance program. Uh, you can wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm part of this community and I'm part of the solution. I'm going to exercise some, some goodwill. I'll amortize over a 20 unit, you know, mixed use um, building, uh, three, five, seven units that are moderately priced and still be able to make the money I need, need, need on my development. So there's plenty of opportunity for this to be organically grown. But you'll, you'll see our team, especially with developers wishing to do cool things. Well, cool things don't include just sidewalks and access to transit. It includes some commitment to all individuals with regard to housing choice. Great. Uh, we're almost out of town. Christian, is there anything else uh, before you um, let the people? Yes, I, th I think a quick answer. Um, we have a, a colleague who's with the Department of Family and Protective Services who asked about transportation for uh, people who've relocated um, and, and basically said that, you know, the newness of the unit might wear off if you have difficulty um, getting to a job or a grocery store. I don't know if that's a Sonia question or. Yeah, and I, I think I understood them say that one of the things they talked about was access to public uh, transportation routes. But Sonia, uh, did you get that question? Yes, I did. And and so prior to, as as Mary Margaret had mentioned earlier, we researched all of the areas in which our developments were going in as far as transportation, access to amenities, et cetera. We even got down as far as how close the the closest bus stop is to the property uh, to ensure that our residents, those that didn't have reliable transportation and did depend on public transportation would continue to have access to it. And then the other thing prior to these developments going into place, Mary Margaret will tell you, we worked with, with um, Trinity Metro on bus routes and everything to ensure that we weren't putting people in a situation where they were going to be stuck and, and not have access and opportunity. Right. Um, so the newness, yeah, if I could just add, we've been doing this since 2017. And so we moved our first family from the Butler community um, in December of 2017, Mary Margaret would tell you, right before Christmas. And it was really, really cool to, to be a part of that process. But the newness is now wearing off. Our residents have settled into their new communities. They've become very acclimated and doing quite well. All right. Just, and just, Michael, were you just, trying to say something? Yeah, just quickly. If any of the social agencies that are hearing us today have individuals where they're trying to get them to medical trips, job interviews, whatever, and don't have access to transit vouchers of some kind, uh, let Mary Margaret and her staff know we have a program to, in great partnerships with Trinity Metro, we'll get folks to where they have to go for those particular services. I don't want social agencies to have to, you know, I only have 10 vouchers for the week and I get to decide if someone can go on a job interview or go see the doctor. We went to the Regional Transportation Council to fix that problem. So if there is need, please let Mary Margaret know or let our office know Great. our contacts are there. Let me call you back and add me to help. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Christian, uh, anything you want to tell our audience out there about how they can get this video and? Yes, yeah, sure. Bobbery, I think we should answer um, our good friend Lily Biggins' questions. Oh, uh, I just she, it's okay. She asked, what more can we do to develop more affordable housing? What is our leverage to expand this product? 
Okay, Michael, I think you were speaking to that. Well, I, I think if you're a human being and you witness 2020, I know I signed up to eliminate food deserts in my personal life and in my work life and I'm working hard to do that. Uh, if you haven't signed up yet, you may live, a, live be a member of a housing authority or, or a housing association, or you may be a developer or you may, there's lots of opportunity for you to be uh, baptized into Mary Margaret's method of thinking mm. and to be a solution and don't, don't ask her and the federal government to be the driver. The forward community has a history of, of, of grassroots bottom-up solutions. And I think we challenge our community to, to be part of that solution. Great. Christian, uh, tell us how we can see the film if we need it to show it again. Sure, Bob Ray. Um, I did put the link to the video in the chat and I'm now going to the chat that no one can um, answer there. And then I'm going to post our contact information here online for everyone to see and do another share screen, if you guys don't mind. Yeah. And, and everybody who registered will get notified about other yes, things, sir. right? Yes, sir. We'll be and here is our contact information with the link to the video and we will send out a follow up email thanking you for your participation and uh, sharing this link with you. Well, all right. Well, I want to thank Mary Margaret Lemons, Sonia Barnett, Michael Morris and Deborah Jennings for joining us. And thanks to all of you for participating with us today. That'll do for us. Have a good day. Take care, everyone. Be safe. That'd be good, thank you.